again as we are in the book of Leviticus and uh, we are in Leviticus chapters 19 and 20. As I've been going through the book of Leviticus, as I've been having conversations with people, some of the things that uh, people have asked me, the questions that people have asked me, I thought I'll take a few moments this morning to actually go through Leviticus chapters 1 and through 17, just to kind of get an outline uh, in basic format as to what Leviticus is all about. Now, in order to understand the book of Leviticus, we are going to divide the book of Leviticus into two parts. Uh, That's chapters 1 through 17 and chapters 18 through 27. Chapters 1 1 through 17 is the way to God, and chapters 18 through 27 is our walk with God. One has to do with worship, that is the way to God, how people are to worship Him, and then the walk with God has to do with our sanctification, and that is chapters 18 through 27. Just kind of getting a little more idea as to where we are in the book of Leviticus, we need to begin in the Garden of Eden. Remember, in the Garden of Eden, man sinned. And as man sinned, God drives them away from the Garden of Eden. And man tried to come back to the Garden of Eden on their own terms. But the more they tried, the further they were driven away from God. And God took them to Egypt. And they were in Egypt for many years. And God in His mercy redeems them from Egypt. And you know the story in the book of Exodus where they walked through the Red Sea. And then God brings them to the holy mountain. So God redeems them. God saves them from Egypt. And then God brings them to the holy mountain in the wilderness. And there, they're going to worship God at the mountain. So here, God dwells in the mountain, and only Moses is allowed to go up to the mountain. And Israel had to stay away from the mountain. They could not even touch the mountain because God is a holy God. Keep in mind, a holy God cannot dwell with unholy people. Then God gives them instructions. Uh, He gave instructions to Moses uh, to build a tabernacle in Exodus chapters 25 through 40. And God would then come and dwell with the people in their midst. And we read in Exodus chapter 29, we read in verses 45 and 46, it says, I will dwell among the people of Israel and will be their God, and they shall know that I am the Lord their God, who brought them out of the land of Egypt, that I might dwell among them. I am the Lord their God. And so God's going to dwell among them. But in order for God to dwell with his people, his people had to be holy. A holy God cannot dwell with unholy people. So God, first of all, gave them instructions on how they are to approach a holy God. And that is what we studied in Leviticus chapters 1 through 17. We saw all the worship. We saw chapters 1 through 7, how the different sacrifices had to be offered. And then we saw how the priests were prepared, were ordained for the work of the ministry. And as we go through... Uh, we, we saw the different sacrifices, what were clean animals, what were unclean animals. And then finally, we came to the icing on the cake of that section in Leviticus chapter 16, which we did on Easter Sunday. And we looked at Yom Kippur and we saw how all these offerings actually foreshadowed the coming of Christ and how Christ becomes the sacrificial offering on the cross. Now, chapters 18 through 27 of Leviticus, chapters 18 to 27, we see stipulations that God gives the people so that they can live holy lives, so that God can continue to dwell with them. And so today, as we look at chapters 19 and chapters 20, keep in mind, chapter 19 is one of the sweetest chapters in the Bible. You see, the well-known verse in the Bible, you shall love the Lord, uh, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, is borrowed from Leviticus chapter 19. Today, as we walk through chapters 19 and 20, I've titled my sermon, Holiness. And let me give you the outline for chapters 19 and 20. Holiness is commanded in chapter 19, verses 1 and 2, and chapter 20, verses 7 and 8. Holiness demands obedience. Leviticus chapter 19, verses 3 through 18. Third, holiness implies separation. Leviticus 19, 
verses 19 through 20, and uh, that is 19 through chapter 20, verse 27. And holiness ignored brings consequences. Holiness ignored brings consequences. And we see that in Leviticus chapter 20, verses 9 through 21. Let's look at the first truth. Holiness is commanded. And we see this in Leviticus chapter 19, verses 1 and 2, and Leviticus chapter 20, verses 7 and 8. Let me read those two passages for you. Leviticus 19, verses 1 and 2 reads, And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to all the congregation of the people of Israel, and say to them, You shall be holy, for I, the Lord, your God, am holy. Leviticus chapter 20 Verses 7 through 8, we read, Consecrate yourself, therefore, and be holy, for I am the Lord your God. Verse 8, Keep my statutes and do them. I am the Lord who sanctifies you. You see, we, we see the command in verse 2. Be holy because I, Yahweh, your God, am holy. God said this phrase about four times in Leviticus chapter 11, um, chapter 19, and chapter 20. We see that in chapter, uh, Leviticus chapter 11, verse 44 and 45, chapter 19, verse 2, and chapter 20, verse 26. And then he said this again in Leviticus chapter 20, verse 7. He said, be holy for I am Yahweh your God. You see, God also repeated this command in the New Testament. Um, we read about this in First Peter chapter 1, verse 16. Be holy. What does holiness mean? The word holy appears in the Bible around 600 times. In the Declaration of Independence, Thomas Jefferson declared that one of the inherent and unalienable rights of man is the pursuit of happiness. For us as Christians... The preeminent desire and demand of God for us in our lives is the continual pursuit of holiness. And I want to make you aware that when we are holy, we may not always be happy. And if you believe that the pursuit of happiness is your fundamental, unalienable right, then you will have reason to be unhappy. Why? Because you will resort to being happy at the cost of pursuing holiness. And you will say, I want to be happy rather than being holy. And if you are not holy, then you will not be happy in a sense, in a biblical sense. In a worldly sense, you may be happy because that's what your, your life goal is. That's your idol in your life, to be happy all the time. So the question you and I need to handle is, uh, uh, to really examine our hearts today is, when we think about holiness, what is more important to us? Is happiness more important to us or is holiness more important to us? And it doesn't mean that if you're holy, you're going to be unhappy, but it is not necessary that when you pursue holiness that you will always be happy. God wants you to be holy more than being happy. So keep that in mind as we go through the whole question of holiness. So what does it mean to be holy? Holiness is archaic to our Christian culture. You know, when people think about holiness, they immediately think of women with long skirts, black stockings, hair tied in a bun, like Amish people. Or they may think of people who are self-righteous or fair sacred. Jonathan Edwards writes, Holiness is not something which is gloomy, sour, and unpleasant, but sweet and lovely. To be holy means to be morally blameless. It means to be separated from sin and therefore consecrated to God. Holiness is a condition of our hearts created by God. And, and in turn, it's our responsibility to live out that life for the glory of God. Now, in our natural state, we don't desire holiness. In our natural state, we are spiritually dead people. 
We are desperately wicked. We are carnal. And we are alive under sin and Satan. We love to do the deeds of Satan. But something happens when God regenerates us. When God regenerates us, when he causes us to be born again, he awakens our dead soul, gives us a new heart, and puts his Holy Spirit within us. We repent of our sin. We put our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And we are justified. We are sanctified. And we are adopted. You see, becoming holy is something that God does in us. He changes our hearts and he makes us holy. Second, holiness is not only what God does in us, but we are responsible to live a life of holiness. Let me tell you what that means. A farmer plows his field. He sows the seed. He fertilizes and cultivates. All the while, he knows that at the end of the day, he cannot cause the seed to germinate nor can he produce the rain and the sunshine for growing and harvesting the crop. For a successful harvest, the farmer is dependent on these things from God. God is the one who provides the rain. God is the one who provides the sunshine for growing and harvesting the crop. But at the same time, the farmer knows that God will not do what the farmer should do. And we know what the farmer should do. He needs to plant the seed. He needs to plow the fields, and he needs to harvest. So in the same way, the pursuit of holiness is a joint venture between God and the Christian. None of us can attain any degree of holiness without God first working in our lives. And none of us can attain any holiness without any effort from our part. You see, God has made it possible for us to walk in holiness, but he has also given us a responsibility For doing the walking. He does not do that for us. Hebrews chapter 12. Verse 14. Reads. Strive for peace with everyone. And for holiness. Without which no one will see the Lord. You see. Two two thoughts are, are seen in this verse. First. We are to strive for holiness. We are to pursue holiness. Second. This is going to be a lifelong task. You don't become holy the moment you're born again. It's a process of progressive sanctification. You grow more and more like Christ. You see, holiness is progressive. At the same time, it's a command. Holiness is a command. It's not an option. It's not a suggestion. And that is why we need to understand that we are called to be holy, and at the same time, we need to be working on our holiness. Holiness is not at all optional. And if that's the case, that holiness is a command and holiness is not optional, why are we failing in our holiness? Maybe we have failed to grasp why we are to be holy. And I want you to see the second half of Leviticus chapter 19, verse 2. It reads, You shall be holy. Now he goes on to give the reason why you are to be holy. I, the Lord, your God, am holy. You see, people are called to be holy because God is who he says he is. It says, I, the Lord, your Yahweh, your God, am holy. And this is what he told the Israelites in, in Leviticus chapter 18. He said, you shall keep my statutes and my rules and keep my statutes and walk in them. Why? Because I am the Lord your God. We read in Isaiah chapter 6 verses 1, 2, and 3. When Isaiah had a vision of God, what did he see? He saw the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up. And a train of his robe filled the temple, and above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings, with two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The earth is full of his glory. 
You see, we are, we see the holiness of God. God is a holy God. And, and we are called to be holy. Why? Because God is holy. Now, keep in mind, you and I are made holy when we are born again. The righteousness of Christ is imputed to us. And, uh, and we are seen uh, with, in God's eyes, we are positionally holy. We have the righteousness of Christ in us. Positional holiness as a Christian, when we become a Christian, we are positionally holy. And positional holiness will and should result in practical holiness. Meaning our day-to-day -day life should match who we are positionally. A life without practical holiness would be a contradiction of biblical Christianity. You see, beloved, holiness is missing in our church, even missing in our private lives. And the reason is that many professing believers make their own interpretation of scriptures to suit their morality. We have professing believers practicing sexual immorality cussing, lying, cheating, oppressing others, slandering one another, selfish, being lustful, and all the while justifying their actions. They'll say, well, we have liberty in Christ. And some of them may understand the scriptures correctly, but they will use a mantra to make these vices tolerable. Uh, you know what they would say to accommodate their sinful lifestyle. They'll say something to this effect, and you probably heard this. No one is perfect after all. And, and beloved, we as a church are not saying that we have to attain sinless perfection, because that's not biblical. But making statements like, we are not perfect, is to make excuses for our sin. And such people continue to live a life contrary to God's command, and that is not biblical. Holiness, my friend, is non-negotiable. It's a command. God commands us to be holy, and that's what we see in Leviticus chapter 19, verses 1 and 2, and Leviticus chapter 20, verses 7 and 8. Next, let's go to the next point, and that is holiness demands obedience. And we see this in Leviticus chapter 19, verses 3 through 18, and verses 32 through 37. Here we see that God gives the nation of Israel concrete, tangible examples of what it means to be holy. You see, holiness is not some abstract idea, but uh, is a daily, mundane, practical reality woven into the fabric of our daily life. So we see in Leviticus chapter 19, as he gives us tangible ways that we got to demonstrate our holiness. Because as I told you, when we are positionally holy, it has to result in practical holiness. And what does that look like in our day-to-day -day life? And God is now giving the nation of Israel practical, tangible ways to demonstrate that holiness. So let's first begin in verses 3 through 5. We see holiness specified in terms of obedience to the Ten Commandments. Uh, you find in, in verse 3 of chapter 19, Every one of you shall revere his mother and his father. So here you find the fifth commandment, Honor your father and your mother. And then verse 3 continues, You shall keep my Sabbaths. I am the Lord. There again, you see the fourth commandment, the fourth of the Ten Commandments. And then verse 4 of chapter 19 reads, Do not turn to idols or make for yourselves any gods of cast metal. metal. I am the Lord your God. And so we he see here the first and the second commandment in, in verse 4. And then as you further go down to verse 9 of chapter 19 through verse 18, you find God giving other tangible ways to uh, show or to demonstrate holiness in your life. And in fact, as you look at verses 9 through 18 of chapter 19, you have five ways to love your neighbor. 
Five ways. And let me give you five ways to love your neighbor. And the first one is seen in verse 9 and 10. Verses 9 and 10. And that is you love your neighbor with your possessions. The second way you love your neighbor is seen in verses 11 and 12. And that is you love your neighbor by being truthful. The third way to love your neighbor is seen in verses 13 and 14. And that is you love your neighbor with your actions. And then you find in verse 15 and 16 that you love your neighbor with your judgments. And in verse 17 and 18, you love your neighbor with your attitudes. So let me go through that a little more in detail, kind of break it down for you to help you see how, what are the tangible ways and how you can love your neighbor and how we can kind of make it practical in our lives today. First, uh, I want you to keep this in mind. When I'm using the word neighbor, remember the story of the, the Good Samaritan and Jesus' uh, you know, question was, who is your neighbor? And, and Jesus explaining and putting that story down. I want to help you understand who is your neighbor. And this is what I mean when I say your neighbor is anyone we associate with regularly. Someone with whom we are involved in everyday living. For example, people in our local church could be our neighbors. Your immediate family members or extended family members are your neighbors. Uh, your close friends are your neighbors. Your spouse is your neighbor. Your children are your neighbors. So people you work with are your neighbors. So that's what I mean when I say your neighbor. Now, let's look at five ways we can love our neighbors. First, we are to love our neighbors with our possession. Verses 9 and 10. When you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not reap your field, right up to its edge. That means you, should, you have to leave a portion of your field without touching it. Neither shall you gather the gleanings, that is the things that fall down, the, the harvest that falls on the ground after your harvest. Verse 10, you shall not strip your vineyard bare. Neither shall you gather the fallen grapes of your vineyard. So when you gather grapes, make sure you leave some on your vineyard. You shall leave them for the poor and for the sojourner. I am the Lord, your God. Stop right there. You see, the Israelites were told not to reap their fields all the way to the edges. They were not to glean all their gleanings. And neither were they to take away all the grapes of the wine. They are to leave them for the poor. And you've seen this in the story of Ruth, where Boaz um, tells Ruth to glean from his fields and even glean from the sheaves. The sheaves were the, the piles that have been gathered at, after the harvest. He said you could even take from that. You see, when we are thinking about the laws of gleaning that is given to the Old Testament Israel, Israelite, it was given in addition to the tithes and offerings. The regular tithes and offering went towards the priests and the temple maintenance. This accounted for almost 20% of their income. But this law regarding gleanings for the poor was in addition to their tithes and offering. You see, the poor of the land were allowed to walk into the field and gather a portion of the harvest left there intentionally by the owner of the field. So if you want a simple parallel understanding of what that looks like, think of some fruit trees in your backyard. And you leave some fruits intentionally on the tree for the poor and the homeless to come and pluck off from your own, from your tree. Now, again, not will you pluck all the good ones and leave the rotten and the ones that the birds have eaten for the, the poor and the homeless. It's actually you make sure that you're leaving some for the poor and the needy. And, and we, we are not farmers today. Now, it may apply if you're a farmer in some sense where you kind of take care of the poor and needy, but how does it apply to us today, right now, where you are? You see, keep in mind, to the Israelites, gleaning was a conscious decision. They left a portion of the field for the poor. The poor and the needy benefited from those who chose not to maximize on their profits. So the farmer is intentionally choosing to leave a portion behind. 
He was not thinking, well, I'm going to gather that, that as well, and maybe I can, I can probably make another car payment. Maybe I'm going to gather that as well so that I can plan for a, a vacation next year. That's not what he did. He chose to intentionally leave a portion behind for the poor and needy. Now, in those days, there were no in and out and Popeyes. I mean, you just walked into somebody's field and ate what was left there if you are poor and you are needy. So, how does it transition to us? Well, beloved, we must deliberately manage our finances so that we will have enough left over after our regular giving to the church to give to the poor, to those in need. How do we do that? Well, first of all, you need to set up your monthly budget with that flexibility in your budget to give. So you set it up in such a way where you are able to give liberally and you're able to give cheerfully. We ought to hold on to our money very loosely. Let some of our money fall off our hands so that the poor and the needy can be ministered to. That means we are to live on a budget, a budget in which we have made a conscious decision to first set aside a portion of our income to the Lord. This is your regular giving to the Lord. And then you set aside a portion for some of the giving to the poor and needy. Now, as you see a need in the lives of people, you're able to take that portion that you've set aside and give as needed. Now, as a church, we have something known as Benevolent Fund. Uh, we collect that uh, the first week of every month. It's a fund that is set aside for people that truly need some extra income, some extra money, uh, some extra dollars to take them through the month. Now, keep in mind, this is in addition to what you regularly give to the church. So when you get that extra fund, when you get that extra cash, when you get that extra stimulus check, what do you do? You can put aside a portion of that or completely to, for people in need. And then you keep your ears close to the ground. And as you keep your ears close to the ground, you're able to know, you're able to see for the people that are in need. And as you give, make sure your left hand doesn't know what your right hand is giving. You see, that's a tangible expression of holiness. And it's seen in the way you love others with your possessions. And why do you love others with your possessions? And we see the answer there, right there in that verse. It says in verse 10, I am the Lord, your God. The same reason for holiness. Why should we be holy? I am the Lord, your God. Why should we love our neighbor with our possessions? I am the Lord, your God. Let's look at the second way we love our neighbor is by being truthful. We see this in Leviticus chapter 19, verses 11 and 12. Let me read that for you. It says, you shall not steal. You shall not deal falsely. You shall not lie to one another. You shall not swear by my name falsely. And so profane the name of your God. I am the Lord. You see, beloved, being truthful is the opposite of stealing. Being truthful is the opposite of lying. Now, how do you steal? Well, stealing is understood as breaking in, right? Taking in something that doesn't belong to you. But do you also know that you can steal by lying? By falsifying on your taxes? By falsifying on your business transactions? We read in verses 11 and 12 that you are to show your love for your neighbor by speaking the truth with your neighbor. That means you always speak the truth. Now, speaking the truth does not mean you speak your mind out. You want to be careful that as you speak, that you do it solely for the purpose of truly caring for that individual to help that individual. And we are to speak the truth. But at the same time, we do not take anything that belongs to anyone else. That's stealing. Now, there's a reason for speaking the truth. Why do we speak the truth? The reason is found in verse 12. I 
and the Lord your God. Now, keep in mind, this applies to us in many ways. Let me just give you one example. It is important for us to understand, as husbands and wives, you know, that we are to be truthful to our spouses. As a husband, I need to be truthful to my wife. That means there's nothing shady about what I'm doing. I am transparent in the way I live my life, that my wife is able to see what I do and that she completely knows that I'm not hiding anything from her. And that's being truthful uh, to my neighbor because my wife is my neighbor. Let's keep going uh, to the third way we show our love to our neighbor. The third way we show our love to our neighbor is by our actions. And we see that in Leviticus chapter 19, verses 13 and 14. Let me read that for you. You shall not oppress your neighbor or rob him. The wages of a hired worker shall not remain with you all night until the morning. You shall not curse the deaf or put a stumbling block before the blind. But you shall fear your God, for I am the Lord. You see here, the Bible gives us guidelines in how we are to treat our neighbors. We are not to bear false witness. We are not to covet, covet our neighbor's possessions. You know what the nation of Israel did, and we have example after example as to how the nation of Israel treated their neighbors. For example, in Jeremiah chapter 5, verse 8, they desired their neighbor's wives. In Isaiah chapter 3, verse 5, they oppressed each other. In Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 6, they committed adultery with the woman. In Jeremiah chapter 22, verse 13, they did not pay wages to the worker. In Ezekiel chapter 22, verse 12, they improperly took advantage of their neighbors. You see what they did? They oppressed their neighbors. And we are not to take advantage of the weak either. We are not to do any harm uh, to a handicapped person. We are not to curse the deaf. I mean, if you curse the deaf, they won't be able to hear you. Nor should you put a stumbling block in the way of the blind because they are blind. They will not be able to see it. So why would you oppress someone who is deaf? Why would you oppress someone who is blind? And so Bible says you should not oppress your neighbor. You should not take advantage of any handicapped person because, and the reason is given there in verse 14. Again, why you shall fear your God, I am the Lord. Now here there's a little more, uh, um, I mean, look at what he says. He says you won't do these things. It was not there in the other verses, but here it says you shall fear your God. That's one of the ways you show your love for your neighbor is you will not oppress your neighbor. But the reason you don't oppress your neighbor is because you fear the Lord. And because you fear the Lord, you will not do these things. Let me uh, take you to a fourth way to show your love for your neighbor. And that is by being by your judgments. And we read about that in, in Leviticus chapter 19, verses 15 and 16. Let me read that for you. You shall not do injustice. And you shall do no injustice in court. You shall not be partial to the poor or defer to the great, but in righteousness shall you judge your neighbor. You shall not go around as a slanderer among your people. You shall not stand up against the life of your neighbor. I am the Lord. So you see here in verse 15, God forbids injustice and partiality. In other words, we don't play favorites. We do what is right. Sometimes we show partiality to the rich and we look down on the poor. We treat them with contempt. And God is saying here, uh, we are to speak the truth whether we are speaking about a rich person or we are speaking about a poor person. Also, uh, goes on to read there, that you shall, in verse 16, you shall, not, you shall not go about slandering anyone. You see, we should not slander our neighbor. That means we are not to pass on juicy morsels. You see, slander is saying something untrue about someone behind his or her back. 
It is being a tail bearer. And God requires holiness in his people. And holiness includes refraining from saying things about people. Now, whether the report be true or false, we are forbidden strictly to spread it. Now, sometimes you may gossip about other people. Now, you may not gossip about other people to people outside your home. You may gossip about other people in the comfort of your home amongst the members of your family. Now, just because you are doing it with your family members doesn't give you the license to gossip and doesn't make gossip right. Gossip is gossip, even when you talk to your son about it or your daughter about it, about someone in the church. I mean, they don't need to enjoy the juicy morsels. They don't have to be part of that. You see, people love to dig into other people's trash. And when you gossip, you're actually causing the other person to stumble. And not only that, you got to be careful. You know why? Because the reputation of God's people is very precious to God. And when you're slandering someone, you're actually demeaning or diminishing him in front of other people. Love demands that we control our words. We are to speak no evil of any man. Now, this doesn't mean that you sit tight when you see sin. You are to deal with sin, and you got to deal with it according to Matthew 18. That means if you see sin in a person's life, you got to go to that person one-on-one. -on -one. And if he or she does not listen to your pleading to repent, you have no other resort but to go to another brother or sister and include them so that you can plead with that person to repent. You see, that is not gossip. Keep in mind, as long as it is done in the context of Matthew 18, and it's done according to Matthew 18, and, and this is not a sermon here to talk in detail about church discipline, but you can uh, check one of my sermons that I've done on church discipline and kind of it lays out in more elaborate details as to how you got to confront sin in your neighbor. So here we have seen uh, four ways. We will now look at a fifth way to love our neighbors, and we see that in verses 17 and 18. A fifth way to love our neighbor, and that is we love them with our attitude. Let me read verses 17 and 18. You shall not hate your brother in your heart, but you shall reason frankly with your neighbor, lest you incur sin because of him. You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. So here is another command. It says, don't hate your neighbor. And if you see the second part of verse 17, can be seen in probably two ways. Can be understood in two ways, depending on which version of the Bible you're reading. So if you're reading from the New American Standard Bible, it, it states it one way. If you're reading the New International Version, NIV, it states it another way. And let me put that together here. If you're reading from the NASB, it says that one should rebuke his neighbor without hating him in one's heart. That's how the NASB takes it. Or it could also mean that one should rebuke his neighbor so that one might not become guilty of the same sin himself. And that's how the NIV takes it. And I think that's probably the intent of the, of the second part of the verse, verse 17. For example, so if you see your neighbor lusting after another man's wife, or you see your neighbor involved in lying or stealing or pornography or being arrogant or being prideful, what you do is you come alongside him or her to exhort them to confess their sin and repent of their sin. Because if you don't, if you know they are sinning and you stay silent about it, verse 17 says, lest you incur sin because of him. That means you are now becoming a part of that sin because you know they are sinning and you're staying quiet about it. You're not speaking out the truth. You see, that's where we need to be. Uh, the fifth way is that we got to love with our attitude. That is, we are being Christ-like in our love to one another. And then verse 18, uh, verse, uh, 18 goes on to wrap up with that. It says, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And that's the most quoted verse in the Old Testament. Um, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And again, why should I do this? The reason is, Given there, I am the Lord. So we have seen five ways that we can love our neighbor. But then it doesn't stop there. 
Chapter 19 goes on into verses 32 all the way through 37 with still more tangible expressions of love. Or tangible expressions rather of holiness. That means if you're holy, this is what your life should look like in tangible ways. Let's look at more of those expressions in verses 32 to 37 of chapter 19. So let me read verses 32 to 34 to begin with. It says, You shall stand before the gray head and honor the face of an old man. And you shall fear your God. I am the Lord. Verse 33, When a stranger sojourns with you in your land, you shall not do him wrong. Verse 34, You shall treat the stranger who sojourns with you as a native among you. You shall love him as yourself, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. You see, fearing the Lord is directly related to honoring those who are elderly. And we see that in, in verse 32. You shall fear your God, I am the Lord. So if you fear the Lord, you will honor those who are elderly. If you fear the Lord, you will take care of the stranger or the foreigner who dwells among you. Now look at the language here. It says, when a stranger dwells with you, or resides with you in your land, you will do him no wrong. That means you will provide him shelter. You will take care of him. And two reasons are given to take care of the stranger or the foreigner who lives in your land. And that's found in, in verses 33 and 34. One for the simple reason that you yourselves were aliens in a foreign land. Uh, and, and, and God is saying, remember when you were in Egypt. Remember how you were mistreated when you were in Egypt. You're an alien in that land. And second reason is given here is that you, as a child of God, you are now a child of God. You are redeemed. You are a child of God. Now, how do you treat an alien? Don't treat an alien the way the Egyptians treated you. Treat them like you are my son. So, simple present-day application. Now, it has to do with how we treat immigrants in this country. And I know uh, this is a topic that is really sensitive. And politicians would go back and forth on this issue. And this topic, as we all know, has, became, has, has become the debate point uh, in our presidential elections. Everybody wants to know where a candidate stands on immigration policies. Now, you don't have to be a Democrat or a Republican or an Independent to obey this verse in the Bible. This verse plainly states something. It says God's people are to treat immigrants, how? With love and respect. You will treat an alien uh, with justness, with fairness, with kindness, and you'll treat them uprightly. And, and God uh, says in verse 34, you shall love the alien who lives among you as you love yourself. Why? And the reason is given there, because I am the Lord, your God. So we have seen uh, the second point in which we saw that holiness um, demands obedience. And now having seen the second point, uh, tangible expressions of obedience, let us now come to the third point where we see that holiness implies separation. Holiness implies separation. Um, we see this in Leviticus chapter 19, verses 19 to 37. Here in this section, we see miscellaneous statutes. This section consists of 21 laws. And these laws are broken up into smaller units by a sevenfold repetition of the phrase, I am the Lord. Now let me show that to you in chapter 19. Let's begin in verse 20, um, 23. It says, uh, when you come into the land and plant any tree, and it goes on into 24, in the fourth year, all its fruit shall be holy, be holy and offering a praise to the Lord. But in the fifth year, you may eat of its fruit to increase its yield for you. Now look at the first division there. I am the Lord your God. Then he goes on into 26 and 27, and after giving a stipulation there in verse 27, 26, 27, and 28, he says, I am the Lord, I am the Lord. 
Then he goes on into verses 29 and 30, gives a stipulation there, and says, I am the Lord. So we know this is kind of a natural outline here in the book of Le Leviticus chapter 19. You can see how the author is breaking it out into different parts by using the phrase, I am the Lord. Then he goes on into verse 31. He states another stipulation and then says, I am the Lord. Then he goes into verse 32, another stipulation, I am the Lord. Verse 34, another stipulation, I am the Lord your God. And then finally come to verse 36, says, I am the Lord. And the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt. So let's kind of look at these a little more in detail here. As you look at uh, chapter 19, uh, verse 19, it says, You shall keep my statutes. You shall not let your cattle breed with a different kind. You shall not sow uh, your field with two kinds of seed, nor shall you wear a garment of cloth made of two kinds of material. So here in verse 19, we see there's a distinction between the mixing of two kinds of animals. Uh, breeding cattle of different species, like horse and a, and a donkey, or breeding of a sheep with a goat was not allowed. A mixing of two kinds of seeds were not allowed. Mixing of two kinds of materials and garments were not allowed. You see, this was characteristic of a certain kind of idolatrous practices. Now, we are not going to go into detail, but uh, the Canaanites did these things. And God wanted to show the nation of Israel that when you go into the promised land, the Canaanites are going to be there. You are going to be distinct. You're going to be separate. You're not going to be acting like them. You are not going to uh, borrow in a, any of their practices. You're going to be a distinct people. That's why I said holiness means separation. You see, God's people are to manifest God's holiness by keeping the ceremonial distinctions from the pagan Canaanite cultures. Now, let's look at verses 20 to 22. If a man lies sexually with a woman who is a slave assigned to another man and not yet ransomed or given a freedom, a distinction shall be made. They shall not be put to death because she was not free. But he shall bring his compensation to the Lord, to the entrance of the tent of meeting, a ram for a guilt offering. And the priest shall make atonement for him with the ram of the guilt offering before the Lord for his sin that he has committed. And he shall be forgiven for the sin that he has committed. Now, here we find that God calls us to observe the sanctity of marriage. There is to be no sexual relationship outside of marriage. Period. Sex is meant to be within the boundaries of illegal marriage. Just because you said your husband and wife in the privacy of a bedroom doesn't make you a married couple. Just because you said you're covenanted to each other in the privacy of a bedroom doesn't make you a married couple. It has to be a legal marriage. And in a legal marriage is when sexual relationship is permiss permissible. And we know that otherwise it's fornication or adultery. The marriage bed, the Bible says, is to be kept honorable. You see, our pagan culture redefines marriage. We have left it to the Supreme Court to define marriage for us. And the Canaanites had their own standards of marriage. And holiness in the nation of Israel, God specifies here that when you go out there, you will be separate from that culture. There will be a distinction between you and them. Your ways of understanding marriage is not going to be their ways of understanding marriage. Your ways of understanding sex is not the way they understand sex. And so there is a separation from the culture around them. We also see in verses 23 through 31, there's a distinction between falsehood and truth. Falsehood and truth. Now, um, he prohibits a list of sins that were commonly practiced by those who believed in pagan religions. What were some of those practices? And we see that in, in verse 25. In the fifth year, you may eat of its fruit. That's it. Sorry, verse 24 says, when you go into the land, let me back up, please. Sorry, verse 23. When you come into the land and plant any kind of tree for food, you shall regard it as its fruit as forbidden. The three years you shall wait. That means you're going to wait for three years and then you don't eat of it. And then verse 24, in the fourth year, all its fruit shall be holy and offering a praise to the Lord. And in the fifth year, 
You may eat of its fruit to increase its yield for you. I am the Lord your God. So that's one stipulation right then. Then he goes on into verse 26. You shall not eat any flesh with the blood in it. That's clear. We've seen why it should not happen in the previous sermons. Then he goes on to say, you shall not interpret omens or tell fortunes. That's ruled out. Verse 27. Uh, you shall not round off the air on your temples or mar the edges of your beard. Again, that's ruled out. Why? Because the pagans did that. The, the Canaanites did that. Verse 28. You shall not make any cuts on your body for the dead. And again, that's ruled out. Why? Because the Canaanites did that. And, and, and being holy and being God's um, chosen ones, you are to be showing yourself as holy, distinct from the culture around you. So you don't do any of the things that they did. And goes on to read in verse 28, or tattoo yourselves. Why? Because I'm the Lord, your God. Now, <laughs> this is something that everyone wants to hear. You know, what do you think about tattoos? As I was teaching in a Christian high school, um, my students would ask me this question. They always wanted to know whether tattoo was allowed in the Bible. And eventually they knew the answer. They always knew the Old Testament text where it says you shall not tattoo. And they would themselves tell me, well, there's nothing in the New Testament. So is it okay to get a tattoo? Now, again, this is not an, uh, a topic uh, to deal with it right now. If you look at the context here, we know specifically it was you do, you do not become a part of the pagan religion around you. That is why it was given to the nation of Israel. But at the same time, you need to keep in mind that if you if you take a stand here, well, I'm going to accept this, I'm going to accept this and this and this, and this is not a, a, you know, applicable to me, we got to be very careful that we give valid reasons for it. Now, what are my thoughts on tattoo? Well, I have five things I can tell you quickly. Uh, take it and leave it. First, you got to look, is it necessary? Do I really need that? Um, I, a student would ask me, should I tattoo? And uh, I said, why? Well, I'm going to tattoo John 3.16, they would say. Well, okay, why? And I they would say, well, because John 3.16, then people will see that and they'll ask me. And then I have an opportunity to evangelize. And I would say, well, why don't you just open your mouth and speak John 3.16? Why don't you just share John 3.16? So, well, the question is, is it necessary? Do I really need them? Second, is it profitable? And we read that in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 12. It says, all things are lawful for me. But all things are not profitable. So the thing we need to check into our own lives is, is it profitable? Uh, third, is it Christ-like? First uh, John chapter 2, verse 6, The one who says he abides in Christ ought himself to walk in the same manner as he walked. So is it Christ-like? Third, I mean, sorry, fourth, is it a good testimony? What I'm doing, is it going to create a good testimony to people around me? Uh, and we read that in Colossians chapter 4, verse 5. Conduct yourself with wisdom towards outsiders, making the most of your opportunity. So we've seen, is it necessary? Is it profitable? Is it Christ-like? Is it a good testimony? And then, um, is it edifying? Uh, you know, again, going back to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, not all things are edifying. You know, you have a lot of liberty in what you do, but do they really edify? Is it edifying? And finally, I would ask them, is it glorifying God? And we know that in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31, do all things for the glory of God. And so how is it glorifying God? So uh, I think um, I, I would answer that quick question there. Is it, is it okay to tattoo? I don't know if I've answered your question, but um, I would use these principles to answer that. Let's come back to the text here. So we are to be careful that there is a distinction. Holiness demands separation. Let me read another text because we're looking at Leviticus chapter 20 as well. Let me read Leviticus chapter 20, verses 22 through 26. Leviticus chapter 20, verses 22 through 26. You shall therefore keep all my statutes and all my rules and do them, that the land where I'm bringing you to live may not vomit you out. So there's judgment. And you shall not walk in the customs of the nations that I'm driving out before you. You see, that's the em emphasis here. You're holy. Don't walk in their ways. For they did all these things. And therefore, I detested them. Verse 24. But I have said to you, 
you shall inherit their land, and I will give it to you to possess a land flowing with milk and honey. I'm the Lord your God who has separated you from all the people. So you see, holiness demands separation. We are a separate people. Let's move on. Verse 25. You shall therefore separate the clean beast from the unclean and the unclean bird from the clean. You shall not make yourself detestable by beast or by bird or by anything with which the ground crawls, which I have set apart for you to hold unclean. You shall be holy to me. Verse 26. For I, the Lord, am holy and have separated you from the peoples that you should be mine. Again, holiness demands separation. God has separated us from the peoples that you should be mine. So here we see in verses 24 and 26 is loud and clear. Holiness demands that we are a separated people. We are not to be friends with the world around us. Remember 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 and 15 through 17 in the New Testament? It says, Do not love the world or the things of the world. If any man loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with his desires. But whoever does the will of God abides forever. Let me read for you what John McCarter writes in regard to this verse in his study Bible. He writes, While the world's philosophies and ideologies and much that it offers may appear attractive and appealing, he says it is deception. It is evil, harmful, ruinous, and satanic. Uh, ruinous and satanic. Its deadly theories are raised up against the knowledge of God and hold the souls of men captive. Keep in mind that the world is at enmity with Christ and his followers. The world and its culture is in rebellion with God. The, the culture is controlled by Satan. Oftentimes we somehow take the culture and, and try to make it biblical. Your culture doesn't determine your biblical interpretation. Your biblical interpretation is, should be outside of your culture. Your biblical interpretation should be based on scriptures. Scriptures interpret scriptures. And, and so, our culture is pagan. Our culture is under the influence of Satan. And so, we need to be careful that we don't adopt our cultural understanding in the way we react or respond to the Bible. The Christian must reject the ways of the world and its ideologies. At the same time, it does not mean that we are to live on a mountain humming our way to glory. Because you say, well, pastor, if you're saying that we don't interact with the world, that means then now we've got to go up to a mountain and hum our way to glory. No, that's not what I'm saying. <clears throat> if we do that, how will the lost pagan world come to know Christ? We are to live in this world, yet we are to be separated from the world. Holiness demands that we separate ourselves from our culture and we adopt a biblical framework. So we've seen holiness is a command. Holiness demands obedience. Holiness implies separation. And now, fourthly, holiness ignored brings consequences. And we see this in Leviticus chapter 20. Verses 9 through 21. Leviticus chapter 20, verses 9 through 21. I'm not going to be reading the entire passage here for you, but as you read through verses 9 through 21, we see serious penalties for serious sins. Many of these sins are sexual in nature, and when committed, these sins have serious consequences. As you see in verse 10, if a man commits adultery, there's the penalty of death. I mean, there's a death penalty for the one who's committing adultery. Uh, verse uh, 10, uh, verse 11, if you commit incest. Uh, verse um, 13, if, you, uh, if, uh, if a man lies with a man or a woman uh, lies with a woman, they have committed an abomination. That's homosexuality. It's a death penalty. 
If you read further down in verse 15, if a man lies with an animal, he shall surely be put to death. That's bestiality. And again, that incurs a death penalty. And if you read further, uh, you'll see that uh, there are some sins where God says, I'll make you childless. There are some sins, he says, I'll curse you if you commit them. In verse 27 of chapter 20, um, verse 27 says, A man or a woman who is a medium or a necromancer, who brings up unfamiliar spirits, shall surely be put to death. They shall be stoned with stones. Their blood shall be upon them. So you see, there's a sober warning that if you're unfaithful to my call for holiness, you will be judged. There are consequences. Now, how does this all apply to us today? Well, God judges people for their sin even today. He's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. God is immutable. So how does he judge sin today? First, <clears throat> God judged sin on the cross. He sent Jesus Christ into this world to die for the sins of his people. The Bible reads in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, For our sake he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Romans chapter 10, sorry, Romans chapter 5, verses 8 through 10, we see that God shows his love for us and that while we were sinners, what happened? Christ died for us. Isaiah chapter 53, verse 6 reads, All like sheep, we have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. So in Christ, we are no longer under the wrath of God. We are no longer under the penalty of sin. For Peter chapter 2, verse 24, we read, He himself bore our sins in his body on a tree, that we might die to sin. And live to righteousness. Beloved in Christ. You have his righteousness. You are forgiven of your sins. Read in Psalm 103. Psalm 103. Verses 10 through 12. That we read. He does not deal with us according to our sins. Nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth. So great is his steadfast love towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west. So far. As you remove our transgressions from us. So as believers, we are no longer under condemnation. But what happens when you and I sin? Well, 1 John 1, 9 gives us the answer, right? If we sin, what do we do? If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all our unrighteousness. But keep in mind that when we sin, there will be consequences to our sin. There will be consequences to our bad choices. We also know that according to Hebrews chapter 12, a loving father disciplines his children. And we've seen that in, in Hebrews chapter 12, verse uh, 6. It says, The Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. So there is an aspect of discipline. Why? Because God loves us. But what happens if you're an unbeliever? What happens if you continue to be an unbeliever? Well, you're judged already. The wrath of God, a holy God, is upon your life. And you will live as long as God has ordained your life here on earth. And one day you will die. And when you die, you will stand before him in judgment. At the white throne judgment. And at that point of time, you will be cast into the lake of eternal fire. You will be separated from God forever and ever. Either you separate yourselves today from the world and live unto holiness, or on that day, you will be separated from a holy God. I pray, beloved, that you would live your life for the glory of God, that you will live your life understanding that holiness is a command. That you will live your life understanding that there are implications to your life of holiness. That you, there are tangible ways you got to show that you are holy. That's characteristic of your life as a believer. Otherwise, how would you know that you're a believer? How would anyone know? You should know them by their fruit, right? 
It's not that your obedience saves you. You are obedient because God has saved you. And we keep in mind the implications also involve that you are separating yourselves from the world. And as you separate yourselves from the world, that you live your life for the glory of God. But if you're an unbeliever, keep in mind that God is holy. God is not going to sweep your sin under the carpet. He is a holy God. He's a judge God. He's a just God. And He will judge you. And there's no way you can escape that judgment. So today is a day of salvation. You want to be holy? It begins with salvation. Cry out to God for mercy. Ask God to save you. And when He saves you, He sets you apart unto holiness. You're positionally holy. You're saved. When you're saved, you're washed. You're sanctified. That's what 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 11 says. You are washed. You are sanctified. You are justified. How? In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, by the Spirit of our God. And as a saved person, you now have the Spirit of God living in you. The presence and the power of the Holy Spirit to help you, to enable you, to strengthen you, to live a life of holiness. That you can now depend on His power to live a life of holiness. That you will now be able to live out holy lives by His enablement. And if you are an unbeliever, I plead with you that today is a day of salvation. That you would choose Christ. That you would live for His glory. And that you would repent of your sin and turn to Him. Let's pray. Gracious Father, we pray that you would lead us and guide us in our walk with you. That you would help us to love you and serve you all the days of our life, that we would live holy lives and our holiness would result in tangible forms of obedience, that we would be obedient, obedient to you. As the Bible says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. And not only would we show that in and through our lives, that we would live separated lives, that the world would know that we belong to the Most High God. And at the same time, we pray that, that you would do your work in the life of unbelievers that they would turn to you, that they would repent of their sin, and that they would seek you for salvation. In Jesus' name we pray, and all God's children say, Amen.